Well, good morning and good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are. And, it, you know, if you've been watching the news at all, any time over the last couple of weeks between executive orders and incidents, both at the state, local, and pretty much the corporate area as well, you've noticed that everyone's having issues with cybersecurity that is forefront of mind, that solutions are also forefront of mind. So we brought together three experts from varying viewpoints and backgrounds, but to talk to us and work through with us some of the state of security for state, local, tribal uh, organizations, as well as SMB uh, small business organizations, because there's more commonalities than you would think, as well as more resources available. So with that, we're going to go through each of the presenters will talk to us for a little bit, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So for those who I haven't met or worked with before, I'm Elizabeth Wharton, and I am Chief of Staff at Scythe. And first up, we're going to have Tony Sager, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Evangelist for the Center for Internet Security. Tony, are you ready to walk us through some, I mean, y'all haven't been busy at all, have you? <laughs> no, it, it's been a busy, not only the recent uh, past, but the last several years around elections and so forth. So anyway, hello, RSA, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today, really appreciate it. And we're here today to talk about a shared problem. And I'm not talking about sharing among just the three or four of us here on the panel, but all of us have in common. And, and here's the problem. In cyberspace, most of our economy cannot defend itself in the current model. And by current model, you know what I mean, the build it yourself for, for security, right? Struggle to understand a really complicated problem, buy a lot of stuff, operationalize it, train all your people to be aware, et cetera. Uh, it's just not working, okay? Uh, if you don't have the staff or the ability to understand information, no amount of threat sharing is gonna save you. If you don't have uh, any kind of funding, then you're not gonna buy fancy tools, you're not gonna pay for expensive assessments and, you know, if you don't have the staff to even manage the complexity of them, there's no security framework, no compliance regime, nothing like that is really going to make a big difference. I mean, that's the reality that most of our economy lives in. So yes, I'm talking about small, medium businesses, almost all of them are affected by this, but also state, local, tribal, territorial governments, right? And that's, that's really the area I'm going to talk to you about first here. These this community has a lot in common. We'll hear more about that later, but you know, but kind of my quick phrase is they're outgunned they're undermanned and they're underserved by our industry. And yet these are my neighbors. These are my tradespeople. I live in a rural county. My doctor, my lawyer, my dentist, they're all small businesses. The county elections board, you know, the, the school board, this is the environment in which we live and they are targeted in big ways now. And so, you know, and we, we could blame the victim all we want, but that's not helping anything either. I spent a lifetime working with state and local governments, but also with small businesses. And these are good people. They're not lazy. It's not that they don't care. It's that this problem is too complicated to solve on their own. And so even if you work for a big, bad government agency, lots of funding, big financial sector company, you know, these are your neighbors. These are your tradespeople. These are the local governments that provide services to you. So we're all in this problem, whether we recognize it or not. And we have to realize that traditional approaches of educating, buying, et cetera, are not going to work the way we'd like to, th to think of them as working. So in this session, we're going to look at the nexus of uh, small businesses, state and local governments, and sort of what's in common, what's different, and what's really going on out there, and then some ideas on what we can do about that. Uh, I'll talk about state local governments because I'm part of the um, uh, Center for Internet Security. We're a nonprofit home. One of our major missions is we are the multi-state information sharing and analysis center. So the ISAC. And that's the, uh, the sort of gathering point for state and local governments across the country, 24 seven operational mission. People are reporting incidents. We're providing guidance, bulletins, advisories, all that kind of stuff. In the last couple of years, we've stood up the election infrastructure ISAC, and you can imagine how lively that's been for the last several years. And it's a similar infrastructure, but uh, dealing with the specifics of the election infrastructure at the state and local levels. And so these are complicated, large scale, uh, highly distributed, you might say, enterprises, right? So imagine 90,000 separate entities across state and local governments. So not all governments, many of them are governments, tens of thousands, but also what are called uh, special entities or special authorities. So things like water, sewer, uh, power, um, you know, airports, things like that, right? They all 
they don't uh, pass laws, but they also uh, provide services directly. And, and they're all at risk in this kind of environment here. So part of what we do in uh, helping that community is try to understand it in addition to all these operational services. So we run a big annual survey of the um, 11,000 plus members that we have inside the multi-state ISAC. And uh, just, just summarizing really briefly, a long complicated story, the multi-state ISAC, these are the key problems that were identified you know, overwhelmingly by the state and local governments. And uh, none of these are a surprise and they have not changed in several years. So lack of funding, we all feel that pain, right? Especially if you're a local government that's really been hurt by tax revenues over the last uh, uh, year plus. Uh, the struggle to keep up with the technology and the attackers, right? We're all struggling to make sense of this. There's so much going on in both new technology, but business use of it, and then what attackers are doing, and then the lack of professionals. Imagine trying to hire top-end talent with the kind of budgets that these folks are dealing with. On the positive side, we, here are some of the fact, factors that came out during the survey around uh, what, what, what can lead to success, right? What are good signs of maturity? Well, the, the having professional security staff is a big contributor to success and to maturity. And many state and local governments have none, no professional security staff. IT staff, it's often a very similar picture. Many have one or none. Use of a framework, any framework shows dramatic improvement in maturity and success of a security program. And then governance, we've done a study around this, but also the uh, involvement of executives in these decisions, right? You know, a visibility does, it goes a long way to both understanding the problem, but also putting the right emphasis and the right resources uh, in place. So what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, the, the place to start, if you are state, local, tribal, territorial government, is the ISAC. It's paid for by Homeland Security, right? Most of the services are available free to you. It's a wide range of services, active uh, information services, and um, most provided ahead of time. We're also a major best practice creator and distributor at, at the Center for Internet Security, so uh, CIS benchmarks the CIS controls, these are resources that come along with your membership to multi-state ISAC. And so again, it, it provides this distributed community that shares ideas, best practices, help learn from each other. And that's how most of us learn in this business, right? Learning from someone that's like us and how do we uh, take best use of our resources but um, not have to experiment, not to spend overspend to get to the place where we really need to do something that will really deal with the kinds of attacks that we see uh, today. Uh, but another key part for us is about getting started. It's more, we've spent a lot of time and I've been in this uh, business for four and a half decades now. We spent a lot of time admiring the problem. We need to get to work. And the, the, we, but we also need to focus in on sort of what are the first steps to do? What are the basics? What are the foundation of, uh, of uh, cyber defense? We provide that kind of information for you at the Center for Net Security and it's a part of how we support state and local governments. Anyway, so that problem, I just wanted to set the table for it. Uh, uh, the, um, this is an ongoing challenge that affects every one of us as a citizen. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Lawrence, who sees this as a managed service provider, who has a, happens to have his, uh, customers, lots of uh, state locals, but also small businesses. He'll talk about that challenge and then kind of what is in common and what might be different about that. Lawrence, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. Uh, my name is Lawrence Krushana, um, and I work with Corporate Information Technologies, CIT for short. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us and, and talk about this very important topic. I lead the security practice for CIT and I'm principally involved in identifying, measuring and remediating risk in smaller organizations, mostly mid-market and small government clients. Now our security practice focuses on the area uh, of the business that sits between the technical evaluation and demonstration of risk um, and the uh, helping the executives that are responsible for governance and risk management functions interpret and make decisions about, about and then using that data. We kind of sit between the GRC and focused uh, purple team activities, if you will. Understanding this about our practice is important as we'll discuss here in, in just a minute. Now at CIT, we do use uh, the CIS controls for our assessment and risk government governance work. Uh, in my experience, they provide a very approachable uh, mechanism and a very level playing field for the organizations that adopt them. <clears throat> and the word approachable is, is the important one there. And, and what I mean by that is they offer a starting point that is generally accessible and understandable to most organizations. Now, while their approach is different than NIST CSF or CMMC, they provide a very effective set of controls that incorporate both the organization's size as well as information-centric areas of exposure in the prescribed safeguards that they make. 
Now, before I um, move on, I, I have to share that I have a, a special interest in small business. Uh, I've spent the last decade plus of my life working with smaller organizations, and I've come to love the agility, just the innovation that, that they're just consistently imbued with. Um, these organizations are worth safeguarding and protecting, and that's why I'm here. I firmly believe that it's critical for us as cybersecurity professionals to meet others where they are, especially related to their where they are in their cybersecurity journey. <clears throat> this, this is especially true for smaller businesses, for smaller organizations. Uh, the uh, very often enterprise-esque aesthetic of cybersecurity causes the leadership of uh, SMBs to do nothing because they're afraid that it's not the right thing to do. But it, it may not surprise you to learn that um, roughly 99% of all of the businesses in the US are categorized as small business. Uh, they represent a workforce of approximately 47% of all US employees. These organizations uh, very often have far, far fewer resources to their large enterprise counterparts. They have an internal IT function that's principally focused on the business systems and keeping those running, not on IT security, at least not as a dedicated function. In 2020, roughly 28% of all of the reported cyber attacks were perpetuated against smaller businesses. And that is, again, that's the only one, the ones that are reported. Anecdotally, I reached out to some friends that are in the cyber insurance business and, and asked kind of how that felt. Did that statistic resonate with them? Uh, their estimate back to me was maybe 20 to 30% are actually reported by non-regulated SMBs. So the number could actually be considerably larger. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we perform a, a number of risk assessments annually using the CIS controls. And as we started formalizing the aggregation and analysis of that data, I started to notice some very interesting trends between our small and mid-sized clients and smaller government clients. Specifically, the areas of their shortcomings seem to line up in the same control areas. It's important to say here that I only included data from assessments that were conducted in um, using IG2, or Implementation Group 2 of the controls. If you're not familiar with how the controls are organized, IG2, by its very nature, excludes the smallest and the largest organizations, those in Implementation Groups 1 and 3, from the data set. We have some resources later in the presentation uh, if you're not familiar with how the controls are set up and, and want to learn more about that. But thinking that, that this, this data that we, I was seeing, this pattern I was seeing might have been an aberration in the data set, I started to look externally and got very strong confirmation and correlation of this observation from some broader studies conducted across the information security industry. Now, equally, I found that our larger clients also didn't have the same patterns of exposure. So why is it important? Uh, SMBs and SLTT organizations are often not considered in the same class of risk modeling, Right? One's government, one is commercial, apples and oranges, right? Well, if we think like an adversary, well, that would lead us to, to consider the potential impact of a targeted attack against these two types of organizations. That impact could be catastrophic. But there's also another commonality here between both SMB and SLTT organizations. And that is that both very often heavily rely on the services of a managed services provider or an MSP. MSPs clearly fit into this risk equation. After all, approximately 87% of SMBs outsource some or all of their IT function to an MSP. I think it's important before we go on though to understand a little bit about what organizations comprise the MSP market and who these businesses are. Looking to multiple publications that measure that sort of thing, in 2019, the average size of an MSP was 16 people. It had an, a total top line revenue of just over $3 million. These organizations, the MSPs, are small businesses themselves. They're quite often responsible for everything that either has a blinking light coming out of it or an Ethernet cable hanging out of the back, at least for their small business clients. Now, we had a small subset of data of assessments that uh, we had conducted against some security minded MSPs, uh, but that really wasn't a uh, significant enough to, uh, um, uh, to draw conclusions from. So I approached a number of MSPs and asked if they would participate in a benchmarking study. And their response is what allowed this third dimension of risk to be quantified. And as it turns out, um, the same areas of exposure that SOTT and SMB organizations have 
also line up well with MSPs. And here's the key takeaway. Controls one, five, nine, 11, and 14 are consistently weaker across all of these organizations. <clears throat> it's a common set of exposure across a huge number of organizations, potentially somewhere north of 32 million of them. Collectively, they're more likely to suffer a catastrophic or even fatal outcome following a cyber attack. Most of them are self-reporting that they're under-resourced with limited to no uh, dedicated information security training or personnel. It seems like it's a situation that, that's rife for something bad to happen, and it does. Attacks against both of these organizations have, have in, increased double digits every year, um, especially in the last 10 years. MSPs especially are being targeted by very sophisticated threat actors. They're viewed as a golden goose. Successfully compromise an MSP, you often have unfettered administrative access to dozen or potentially hundreds of other smaller organizations, their clients. Now, the good news here is we have something we can do about the situation. We have a roadmap, we have a prioritized set of controls that prescribe the things that we need to do, and there are ex very, very accessible mechanisms to carry those things out. Now, to tell you more about those things, I'm gonna pass the mic over to one of the smartest guys that I know, um, and someone that has an extreme passion for this um, in both the MSP and SMB space. I'm gonna pass it over to Harry. Lawrence, you're too kind. Hi, my name is Harry Perper, and thank you for joining us today. I work for the MITRE Corporation. However, today I'm representing my own passion for cybersecurity. So the comments, recommendations, and opinions that I express today are strictly mine and not those of the MITRE Corporation. Next slide, please. So I want to talk to you today about what I believe are the most important things that you can do to move yourself up the cybersecurity chain move yourself from being that low hanging fruit to uh, uh, a, a branch or two higher in the tree, okay? The, our, the criminals and adversaries are looking for low hanging fruit. Just taking yourself off of that branch makes a big difference. And they're, and they're low cost and no cost cybersecurity steps you can take right now to do that. So the first one is culture. You have to have a security or cybersecurity culture in your organization. That means that anyone in the organization who uh, receives an email or sees something funny on their computer should be able to ask the question without being um, penalized or, um, or rejected from any conversation up and down the entire chain. Has to start at the top and all the way through the organization. And one way to achieve that culture is through education. An educated workforce understands some of the basic ideas and concepts and um, is interested in looking and, and, and detecting, in, uh, uh, detecting malicious or out of the ordinary aspects of, of uh, what's happening in their email or actually on the screen in front of them uh, will be you can significantly increase the detection capability across your organization and can very quickly identify something that's not right, an adversary moving around your, the, uh, the IT infrastructure of your company. The National Institute of St Standards and Technologies has created something called the NICE framework. The national, uh, the NICE framework. <laughs> Uh, which is what I call a, a dictionary or a encyclopedia of all the different skills and job titles, jobs that need to be done by people in IT and cybersecurity. Uh, there's no sense having making up or rewriting these skill des skills descriptions in uh, whether it's in HR as far as it's a career path or in, as you're creating requisitions to hire new people. All these descriptions of it been created for you, you copy and paste and use them uh, in your HR organization. Passwords, please stop reusing passwords inside and outside your organization. My recommendation is that you give everybody a password manager for, for use personally, as well as the company. That will significantly in increase the uh, your security across your organization and, and also increase the personal security of your employees. And by doing that, you are going to help your business security by preventing issues with your, with, uh, 
the personnel's private security. Multi-factor, multi-factor authentication, we know of it. We know it's called MFA, 2FA. Uh, that should be activated everywhere in your organization. You should encourage all your employees to use that wherever they can in their own personal lives. This is a very significant and becoming a, um, a, uh, a basic tool in just about every cloud service today. More and more of them are going to insist on implementing MFA for every account that you turn on. Microsoft has done studies that multi-factor multi authentication for email reduces your chances of someone taking over your account by about 99% and it's very cost effective, uh, in some cases, zero cost. And that's what I'm all about. I want you to help you move up that tree at the very lowest cost possible. And then there's backups. Without backups, your, your business is at risk, significant risk, existential risk. You've got to plan those backups, understand what data is important to back up. How long do you need to keep it? Where are you going to store that backup? You're gonna store a copy online. You're gonna store a copy offline. I suggest all of the above. How often are you gonna update those backups? You do it daily, hourly, weekly, whatever makes sense for your organization. Um, if you are a tow truck company, you probably don't need to back up that data as often as if you are a hospital. And do it in, do it in small chunks, three month sprints. Pick the most critical data, find the most critical. Do you know what the most critical data is for your organization? Pick that, back it up somewhere, back it up a couple different places. Put a copy, if you're a small business, maybe one of those places in, in your basement. Copy it, take, the, take it home and put it in the basement someplace safe. Um, larger businesses will probably have online services, insist on those online services having offline copies uh, so that you are not strictly network connected in those backups. So Lawrence, that's really, Tony, Elizabeth, that's really uh, my recommendations. There's a lot of free, we're going we're gonna to post some of these, I believe, uh, so a lot of great resources online where you can get more information. Uh, DHS, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, the FTC, SBA, CIS, uh, we've all published cybersecurity recommendations and guidance. Uh, it's out there to be used. Please take advantage of it. And I'll hand it back to Liz. And so one of the things, thank you, gentlemen, for giving us a great overview and a reminder to everyone, if you'll look at the screen now, take a moment. Uh, we have coordinated and pulled together several different resources. There's a QR code that will provide links, additional information, and a kind of undercover, so to speak, uh, as Harry noted, a uh, Prior to my joining my current startup, I was senior assistant city attorney for city of Atlanta. And one of the things, so while I uh, gained valuable experience, I neither speak for the city nor uh, make any, uh, any, I don't know, commonalities. Uh, what is it? The disclaimer at the beginning of books that uh, names and everything have been changed to protect the innocent. And it's purely coincidental. But on March 22nd, 2018, there was a ransomware attack. And from a city that hosts the world's busiest airport, uh, and as Tony noted, we not only do you have the city functions, uh, the watershed department, but you have the Department of Aviation. So you've got all these different pieces playing together. And one of the first things that stuck in my mind that I wanted to kind of uh, go to both what Lawrence and then here we're talking about is that data and knowing what data you have, because it's easy to say we're a city, we like we're a small business. We're we're in Harry's example, we're a tow truck company. But how do you and Lawrence, I guess going to you first, how often, how frequently do you have to have that conversation of do you know what data you have with your customers? 
and helping them figure it out. Uh, Liz, that's, that's, um, that's an incredibly insightful question and one that is obviously informed from, from some of your experience. Uh, it's something that, that I have to have that conversation um, with every single client because so often in the small business space, as, as I mentioned, um, the kind of uh, enterprise-esque air of, of uh, InfoSec, um, small businesses don't think that way. They don't think that they're a target. They don't think that they can do anything against the attacker or they're too small to be considered. So you know, doing a solid inventory of the data, um, that's, that's step one, it's, it's every, every engagement. And um, almost without fail, there is some data that they have in their possession that has some type of, of external regulation or legality around it. Uh, and that, that as the, most of the business owners um, or those that are responsible for managing risk could be an IT manager, uh, they don't even know that it's there. So they don't know what their risk and the exposure is just for regulated data or even asking a simple question. What are the crown jewels? What, what, is the, what is the piece of information or the system that really is most valuable to the organization? And uh, an exercise that I've run through with, with clients is to uh, ask that question separately of those that are involved operationally in the business and then those that are you know, the executives, the owner, the board of directors, asking that question separately and seeing if you get the same answer. And most often you don't, at least I don't, and uh, then bringing two very disparate answers back to the person responsible for IT. Uh, and they're going, I didn't even know I needed to secure that or protect that or back that up. I didn't know anything about that. Um, so how can you protect something if you don't know about it? Well, and once you've identified it uh, and you know and get a better idea of what is in your system, uh, how do you prioritize? And this is kind of for uh, Tony, I'm going to come after you with this one too, because you have crafted the, some of these controls and worked on this. How do you identify and kind of audit your own systems to meet some of the definitions? Because no offense, when y'all are creating some of these controls and when uh, picking on a uh, CIS, but also when you look at the NIST standards and you look at ISO, or you go through all this and you're thinking, what is reasonable? secure it. Like what are, how do you meet these definitions? Who do I go to when I have questions like that? <laughs> That's another loaded question. You have a good questions list. The reasonable uh, question. So you, uh, I think uh, last time I was on a panel with a lawyer, he said something like, I think the majority of the states have some sort of statute that calls for use of reasonable practices to protect a certain kind of data. But that word reasonable is left undefined. And so that's that's part of the dilemma that we have here, right? Reasonable being in, in the eye of the beholder. And I, I sort of a philosophy for CIS, the way I think of it is um, we, we tend to think of the worst case and try to solve the worst problem first. My, my philosophy usually goes the other, like what is the problem that we all have in common? And let's work on that because it's often, that's a place to share resources and ideas and get everyone up to some level. And so the, this notion to me is how do I protect all data at some level? Right, not with expensive, you know, over overkills kind of tools, but how do I protect everything, but recognize that there are things that are critical to the function of the business, and therefore deserve more protection. Right, deserve extra care, deserve extra oversight, and separating the problem that way is one of the ways we try to help people make sense of this at CIS. I think that has been a, a useful way. The other thing that we try to focus on CIS, again, we're technologists, right? So we we live in this world of technology. But you know, a, a business leader typically is not going to have that depth of technology, no matter how much we educate or make them aware, but they should be able to answer questions about what loss of resource would be catastrophic financially to your business, right? They should have some sense of the business question so that folks like Lawrence and Harry can translate that into IT speak. But we, too often we try to get people to sort of become educated in the, about security the way security pros are. And that's just a losing strategy, you know, because it's the rare executive. By the way, they're running companies, they're juggling risk, personnel risk and reputational risk and financial and audit. You know, they're, they're juggling risk in umpteen dimensions. Cyber issues just happen to be one of them. And they're only important in their radar to the extent that it affects the, the successful operation of the company. 
Well, and you raised a great point in kind of the introduction of the topic in that budget, it's all about the money. Uh, when, especially from a state, a local, a tribal territorial, like we only have, the pot is only so big and we're getting pulled in a lot of different directions and whether, well, we can't provide uh, police water services or, well, would you rather get your bags on time or know that in uh, delivering some other services at, at the airport, well, there might be a breach and all of your other stuff. So one of the things of prioritizing and kind of building through and connecting is, uh, Harry, what are some of the, you pointed out some good resources and that information sharing, what are some of the other ways that to kind of move the conversation forward in the work that you're doing as well outside, both with MITRE because MITRE does some great stuff, but also in your, I guess, more passionate free time. Yeah, so my passionate free time is uh, adding to my LinkedIn group called Cybersecurity on a Budget, where, where we talk about these kinds of issues. What, what, are the, what are the cybersecurity techniques? What are the tools that you can deploy at very at a low or no cost that help you move along the journey, move up the tree be, so that you're no longer the lone antelope in the herd on the outside? Okay, how many, how many analogies can I put together at one time here? Uh, well, it, it is, you've talked, you've spoken before as well about the, the low hanging fruit that you want to kind of make attackers work for it. And Correct. through that, a pyramid scheme as well, but a good kind of pyramid scheme, not a bad one. Right, right. So uh, the pyramid scheme is, that's the, the MSPs that, uh, that Lawrence is involved, operates and his buddies, the vendors in that community, there's, uh, there's probably a 10 to one, maybe a hundred to one ratio there uh, from MSPs to small business and SLTT. So if we think about, we're able to teach MSPs how to do security better than they do now, that is gonna flow downhill in an order of magnitude or more uh, to their customers. Uh, one of the things I learned is that the MSP, the, the MSPs are doing are really trying hard to come move their, themselves along in the cybersecurity journey, and uh, as they do that, I believe that they they will understand how to translate that for their small business customers. Um, one thing that I think Tony mentioned about our adversaries, and I want to make clear, is that this is not personal. Our adversaries are attacking us using automation while they're out playing golf. That automation is going to identify all the, all the organizations that are at the lowest hanging fruit. M many of them might have uh, exposed some, uh, some IT device to the public internet without any security or with some password that everybody's used many, many times. So they're using automation to do this. They're not picking on any one particular person. They don't care how big or small your organization is. This is all, this is all I wanna say free money, but their return on investment is huge uh, compared to our, um, compared to an average organization or the organizations that they happen to attack. So uh, people need to remove that mindset that I'm too big or I'm too small to be of any interest to a criminal. Individuals are not too small for a criminal. If they can make a little money, they're going to do it. So assuming that you're too small, assuming that you're going to hide under the radar is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Well, and one of the things we saw uh, allegedly in a city that may or may not be located uh, in the state of Georgia, and comparing that against a Colonial Pipeline, who we heard uh, acknowledged a over $4 million, almost $5 million ransom payment. The ransom demand for the city of Atlanta was 50, around 52000 And so you think of, well, yes, both had the impact or potential impact to just paralyze various things. And so it kind of goes back to what Lawrence also had highlighted 
in building on that is the attackers don't always know, don't always care. It's just sometimes they may have stumbled onto, as you noted, you've left something open and you don't have to, a reminder that you don't have to build the expertise in-house. You've already got a constrained budget. So Lawrence, you had uh, spoken previously as well about the Verizon data breach report and some of the trends there and how, you know, the SMB trend is accelerating and everything. Have you seen additional shifts? I mean, now that we've scared everyone and told them, hey, your SMB, your state and local, you're, you're going to come under attack. What are some of the other trends that you saw from Verizon's report, as well as some of the other reports coming out? Oh, that's that's a, a, a great question. And, and I think, um, you know, the the uh, the one one point I want to make sure I, I illustrate here is uh, in in and surely with, with this crowd and this this audience at, at RSA, um, you know, th this is the represents the best and the brightest in uh, in the industry. Um, in most small businesses, um, they they can't afford to be part of this. Most managed services providers uh, don't know of RSA. They can't be here. Most small small government, they can't be here. They're not hearing this information. They're not hearing and taking the advantage or having the advantage that we all do from being able to hear from amazing people and truly thought leaders in, in the in the uh, in the space. So uh, um, and I, I say that only to uh, allude to the fact that the trends that that we see both you know, actually practically those being uh, uh, demonstrated and, and those that are coming out in things like uh, Verizon uh, data breach report, um, uh, there, there are uh, a, a number of even, even some of the, the uh, um, FBI pens that have come out, the, the notices that FBI has, has issued. Um, these are not the, um, the attacks and the methods that are being used um, are not the latest sexy zero day. This is low hanging fruit. Um, it, it really is some of the most fundamental and elemental pieces of, of InfoSec that maybe if, you, if you're part of the enterprise, you think, oh, well, everyone has MFA or everyone has SSO. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, um, the, in, in fact, it's, it's so not the case. It is a uh, minority of, of clients or of, of our, uh, um, our SMB clients that we see that have MFA enabled or SSO, or even really understand what zero trust is. So the, the trends that we see, I mean, things like RDP, RDP is ubiquitous. Um, unpatched RDP is ubiquitous. Machines that can't be patched because they're running a critical control system or they, they bridge the IT and OT network. And you know, there are no mitigations. The vendors themselves say, no AV, don't patch. This has to be running Windows 98. Not kidding. Uh, um, <laughs> those things are out there, right? And, and they're, they're running. They're running major parts of our society, uh, and the organizations that are responsible for them. They might know that there's a problem. They might not even know that there is a problem with that, um, either because of uh, culture. To, to the point that, that Harry brought up, that it's not, you know, we're, we're too small, we're whatever, um, or they don't know what to do. So it's not the sexy zero days that, that are getting burned here, but the criminals are absolutely still making their money. Uh, and, and Liz, I really appreciate the fact that you, uh, uh, um, you brought up the, the difference in these ransom demands. Uh, that is like the, the you know, uh, attack and then uh, exfiltration of data and then the remonetization of that data is absolutely happening. And uh, in many small businesses, they didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, and so they're, they're getting these uh, uh, multi-million dollar uh, um, ransom demands. And often the attackers already know how much cash they have because they downloaded their bank statements. Exactly. And that tailored, uh, and it sounds like tailoring the solutions. So last second, thank you to everyone who joined, listened in, and the panelists, do y'all have a two word parting, parting shot across the bow, starting with Harry. First, I got to find the unmute button. Two words, culture and education. Excellent. And thank you for inviting me. No. Tony? Uh, I'll repeat my message of get started. <laughs> there's plenty to work with. We can admire the problem, we can agonize over, or we can just get to work. And uh, there's, we provide some guidance to help people get started. 
Thank you. And Lawrence? Uh, I'm going to echo largely what Tony said. Start now. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again to everyone. Please check out the resources and uh, enjoy the rest of your RXA experience.